Hey guys, um, sorry for the delay. Uh, we'll just start in two minutes. So uh, let's continue with like HPL and you know trying to achieve a better performance. So if you all can uh, log into uh, Hummingbird, uh, you know we can get started. Uh, Victor, uh, welcome. Uh, I think this is your first uh, meeting, right? So yeah, uh, welcome and. Uh, what we are trying to do today is so uh, Hummingbird is uh, UCSC's local cluster, uh, a, a local supercomputer at uh, UCSC, uh, which is predominantly used by the uh, life sciences departments. So you know, genomics or uh, the other ones, bioinformatics. And, um, but as students, uh, all of us can access the supercomputer and, you know, do some, uh, experimental runs and learn about how applications work and how we can improve the performance of these applications. So, yeah. Um, to, uh, for, for you to get started, you can just search for, I'll, I'll share my screen, but uh, uh, yeah, you can just search for Hummingbird UCSC and Hummingbird Computational Cluster, the first link. Uh, if you click on this and, you know, getting started guide, you can use this, uh, you know, for the next couple of minutes and uh, like get to know how to uh, uh, access the cluster. Essentially, uh, if, if you are off campus and not connected to EduRome, uh, you need uh, the Cisco VPN client uh, for accessing UCSC's VPN. And uh, yeah, you need to connect to the VPN first, and then you need to uh, SSH uh, into this cluster. That's like a remote connection to the cluster. So all the, all the instructions should be here in the getting started uh, one. So like you're yeah, logging into Hummingbird. So if, if you're using a Mac, you can just use your terminal uh, to access uh, this cluster after uh, joining the UCSC VPN. And then you will, you'll be able to run uh, the experiments that we are trying to do today. Uh, if you have any uh, you know, doubts, uh, I'll just get the others started. And if you encounter any uh, problems while logging into this cluster, uh, you know, I, I'll help you out. Wait, um, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. Yeah, um, I was already, I was already able to like get in the, the hummingbird thing. Oh, awesome. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. Uh, yeah, so let's get started with uh, yeah, the hummingbird cluster. So what we did last week was we built an application, uh, a benchmark called HPL, which is high performance limpack. And it's essentially a matrix multiply it's a, it's a code to multiply large matrices and uh, what it's designed to do is sort of gauge the compute capabilities and the limits of any machine so you can run this code on your laptop you can run it uh, on you know this linux server you can run it in the cloud anything since essentially we are just doing matrix multiplication so uh, the machine doesn't really matter but what matters is uh, you achieve uh, as high performance as possible. And today, like last week, we just installed this application and uh, you know did a basic run with the default parameters. Today, we are trying to uh, understand how these parameters can be tweaked to you know give us better performance. 
So yeah, uh, let's try HPL. Yeah, uh, everybody uh, is in this directory. They submit from where you submitted the run. Did you all uh, run it last? last I couldn't get it to run. Okay. How about you? I read it. Actually, couldn't get it. To run. All right. Okay. Sure. I'll, uh, I'll check out what's going on there. But uh, okay. So what we did last time was we uh, this is the input file hpl.dat and we just uh, plugged in some random values uh, and you know ran this thing and got very poor performance. But what values matter for tuning HPL is this uh, the NS here, the highlighted line, which is 20. Uh, that needs to be a higher number, and we'll sort of understand how NS gets calculated. Uh, Apart from NS, you also need to uh, modify NDs. So NS is like the uh, matrix size. It, it governs what's the size of the matrix, uh, of the matrices that you're multiplying. NB is like block size. It's like, what's the stride? So you won't be multiplying one element at, at one. Uh, it's not an element wise like multiplication. Like you don't go one element at a time. You go in chunks because going one at a time is very slow. So what you also control is what's the size of your mini block that you use to access a large matrix. So like, for example, if your problem size is something like, uh, I don't know, 65,536, uh, you know, something like that, uh, a matrix of 65,000 elements, your block size is probably like you're covering like 192 elements at a time, something like that. But these are two things that you predominantly play with. Apart from that, there's also this PS and QS, which uh, defines how the matrix is decomposed. So this depends on the number of cores on your system. So like Hummingbird, the nodes that we're running on have 24 cores on a single node. So we are decomposing it as four cross six. So if it's like, so the way decomposition works is like, if you have a 2D matrix, you know, uh, how do, how do uh, ranks like, okay, let's see if whiteboard can visualize for them. So one issue that I was facing earlier was the recording is always from the TV. It doesn't capture what I'm uh, doing with my webcam. So uh, let's see, uh, we can pause this video, right? Actually, this video is going to be that uh, Let's see. I'm stopping the share. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah, okay. Will this get the people speaking? Uh, what we can really do is turn the mic on the TV on and uh -huh. then turn this mic off. So the thing is, it switches it. The camera doesn't stay to me as a speaker. Oh. So I, and I'm unable to change that too. Let's see. Uh, let me try again. Uh. 
for now. So it's not for this. Yeah, it's recording what's showing TV. TV. Yeah, let's see if this remains like that. Okay. Okay, so in okay, HPL dot that, this is the input file. And the parameters that we have to modify or tune are NS, NBS, yeah, okay, NBS, uh, P's. Cubes. Okay. What NS is? Matrix size. We can think of NBs as block size. Uh, this governs. Uh, MPI processes grid. Okay, so uh, please. So uh, we have to choose uh, this as high as possible. Like that's what you have to uh, try to figure out. What's the highest NS that you can fit in? So this defines the problem size that uh, resides on uh, RAM. So whatever NS calculations that we will do will depend on the RAM, total RAM of the system. Like on uh, these nodes, I think it's uh, 128 GB of RAM. So we'll use that to calculate NS. So we have to yeah choose as high of a problem size as possible, but it should not be too high as well because then it will just be like, overflow uh, and the computer the, the system will spend a lot more time trying to you know shift focus on you know, the problem at hand and trying to manage the overflow and you also have to leave some space on ram for the operating system and other processes to run so yeah this is the thing that we will mostly try to view uh, if time permits we can also try to tune this. Normally, uh, we try uh, like based on like best practices documents from different vendors. They'll suggest uh, a range of block sizes to try out. Uh, so you know, all of this is very much you know empirical. Like if we just try out various parameters and try to see which ones fit. But there is some science behind it as well. Like there's some uh, logic behind it as well that you know. And although we won't have a lot of time, I mean, I can we can speak about the logic today. But uh, yeah, we are speaking about the logic now. But yeah, uh, during the competition, we have to figure out you know these things as quickly as possible. So yeah, this is the block size. The block size governs like so. If this is your matrix, like. Uh, you know, if you are like say multiplying two matrices, uh, block uh, these are huge matrices. Like this would be something like six thousand elements multiplying six thousand elements with each other, so sixty thousand elements. So if you do it, you know, one at a time, that's very slow, and you can't fit all of these into the registers on you know on the processors that you have. So whatever is your CPU, even that has limited uh, memory, register memory. Your cache has limited register memory. So if you remember the computer architecture, there's CPU. Uh, let's dive into the details. So let's assume a CPU has four cores. Okay. So this will be one socket. Like this is how it looks uh, when you look at uh, the motherboard, right? 
So this will be your socket. Let's say it has four cores. So there are some four cores inside it. Each core normally uh, has its own. So if this is the core where all computations happen, all the ALU uh, arithmetic logic unit, all uh, memory operations. So if you if you have taken any course which is related to assembly language programming, even if you have not, but this is how it works. Like whatever applications that you write at the end when it compiles, it compiles to machine code, right? Which is like assembly language, which you tell like load a particular value, add two values, multiply two values, so on and so forth, and move those values back into some memory space. So you're doing these very basic low level operations, which is happening in assembly language. And that happens, that governs how the code, uh, like act, what's actually happening at the core level. So each core has its some internal memory. Uh, uh, which will be like essentially registers. These are like, you can store values. It has a certain number of registers and you can store values in it. Now, the thing is uh, accessing registers and using registers is very fast, but you have a limited number of registers. So you need some more memory to, you know, do like larger operations. Otherwise it's going to be very slow. Uh, and you can't fit everything in, in, in all these registers. So you have a, a, a hierarchy of memories, you know, uh, there'll be something called L1 cache. So each core has its own L1 cache. Hey, hi. Yeah, each core has its own L1 cache. So if there are four cores, you know, there'll be like L1. L1. So this cache is like just some memory, but it's very close to the core. So it you can store something temporarily here, but since it's close to the core, it will be faster. Like compare uh, if this is your RAM, okay? This is the RAM on your system. The access time of accessing something from cache is orders of magnitude faster than accessing something from RAM. Because there's a lot of, like, in terms of electrical connections and, you know, this is at a very nanosecond, sorry, uh, nanometer level, right? So uh, there you are limited, like these speeds matter a lot. Just, it, just even a few nanometers uh, of distance matter a lot because you have, you have to have uh, those uh, speed changes a lot if, if you go from something close to here to something far. But the difference is this cache again is also very limited in size. This will be like something in KB, kilobytes. Uh, and a RAM as you see is in like gigabytes. So again, you're limited by what you can show here. So is this a pool of cache or is this like uh, each core has a L1 is each core. Typically each core has its own L1 cache. It's like it's on private memory yeah. apart, you know, a bit more uh, than registers. So it's probably like, I don't know, an analogy could be my pockets. If registers is, you know, what I have uh, in my memory or in my hands, okay. If this is, I, I have two hands, I can only store two things, a couple of things in my hands, what's the memory, uh, whatever is the capacity. So this would be much stored in the core. Uh, if I want some more space, which is my own private thing, that's like pockets. Um, so if I'm, a, as a person, if I'm a core, yeah. Yeah, this, this is registers, oh. uh, yeah, but this is pockets, something extra I have, but it is individual to me. Each of you have their own pockets, their own hands. So. Like that. Yeah. Typically, the instruction cache can contain 1,000 instructions, so they can do reordering. And for registers, like it was a 10K or something, or uh, to restore in the L L1 data. And for L2, they are sharing the cache. Oh, so instruction and data are different. And oh, um, you know, uh, as you've seen at the computer architecture courses, you know that you have to update your program counter, and sometimes, uh, because of that cache are taking into account. So you, you sometimes can roll back the program counter, 
at refilling, refilling the tank. Um, and saved. Yes, yes. Oh. And sometimes, and sometimes oh, so this is about like create, like saving a state in a program. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. So this is kind of like a code design inside the your um, in front of, uh, in of your processors. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There's like tiers to it. I see what you're saying. And also because they have TLBs in L1. So sometimes um, if you want to have a content switch or you um, if it issues something from other core to invalidate your cache, it issues a TLB shutdown. That means you flush all the TLB that exists in your L1 cache. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I so so that will be a lot of penalties. So oh, you, you need to know the cost models inside. Like to, to access the registers is two nanos, it's one cycle. But for L1 instruction or L1 data, there'll be do you five have to flush it though. Can't you just overwrite that data or? No, sometimes for semantics, because okay. other cores want to invalidate something in your L1 cache or. Um, I see. In yeah. Like that specific. Yeah, way. that's the semantic of uh, your, your 30 writes. Yeah, I get From it. other core. I get so it. that's a TLB shutdown. So it's TLB shutdown, you have to refill that TLB using LRU cache. Um, if the LRU, something, I wouldn't like that. It will take much longer, like 20 nanoseconds. Yeah. And then why are we putting all this data into the core and then putting it to the RAM? Um, because like all operate all arithmetic and logic operations happen only at the core level. So you have to pull everything inside the core for the back out. Yeah. Yeah, this is very important because when you are seeing the microarchitecture state in your VTron uh, provider, they will show you every state. What's the penalty of one instruction are you passing on? Uh, a specific example, which is your hot, hot, hot data or hot spot. If you inspect on that example, where is your data came from in your code and definitely can optimize it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is the hierarchy. Each core has its own individual L1 cache. There is an L2. Now, designs may vary from CPU to like, uh, socket to socket from different vendors. But typically, L2 cache is shared between some cores, a subset of the cores. So for this example, you can consider like if there are four cores, L1 cache, each core has its own L1 cache. So we have four different L1 caches. L2 cache can be shared by two cores. So you know there are two L2 caches. And then there's one individual L3 cache, which is shared amongst all the cores. And then there's RAM. So in terms of hierarchy, uh, it's like a reverse pyramid, uh, which also determines like the size that you have that's available. So let's say this is disk, which can be hard disk uh, or flash. Uh, okay. Uh, there's even more than that. That's like network. <laughs> there's disk, there's RAM, there's L3, there's L2, there's L1, there's core. So this is like a reverse pyramid, uh, which increases as you go higher in, uh, in this pyramid, you have higher memory capacity, but higher latency in accessing things as well. Uh, where does MPI fit in? MPI governs it entry fits everything. So they have the expression of open share. That means the open share memory. Yeah. It's just in, inside one uh, kernel, but shared memory using IPC. Yeah. But they also had RDMA that's through the network. And they also has a GDR copy, which happens uh, inside your different memory region in your GPU. So they can do point to point copy. No. So, GPU. Yes. Is that slower than network? No, no, GPU are uh, PCIe based. Yeah, and they yeah. have a switch, a V link. Okay. So something they are point to point. Uh, if you have a V link, you can take them as one single GPU if there are two. Yeah. yeah. No, because uh, GPU modeling is something, if you have a V link in one process, if you want to uh, access something from the other GPU, yeah, they yeah. will just fetch it. All the all the memory uh all the memory translations are uh, are triggered by the driver, are managed by driver. 
Yeah, yeah. But only on it's more processes. Yes. Yeah. So, so you need to know that MCI is multi processing interface. Yeah. So, process inside the Linux kernel has the abstraction. So, you could not, because different processes didn't share much of a memory information and they couldn't, and they do not have four or something. So, so they, what they can only do interconnect is first network, then uh, open shim. So it's and, mostly and, about RAM, yeah. it's not about CPU caching. Yes, that, it, it's mostly understand. about the process. So one process yeah. can like to fill one course of that. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. I think I got what you're saying. Yeah, so yeah. the idea there is as a, for performance, what you have to figure out is there's something called like if you're doing some computation, right? So there's always a what do you call it? A trade-off between like the time you spend on com computation versus uh, communication. Yes. And communication is everything here, right? It can be between nodes using the network. It can be accessing some data from your own local storage. Which is a this? It can be. It also means reading something from RAM. It also means reading something from cache. Everything. Compute is what's happening at the core. Communication is all layers here. Okay. So there's always a trade-off between if you are doing some a particular let's say matrix multiplication, right? And if you are doing it like in a, on a large array, if you're multiplying two large arrays one with the other, right? So if you have a particular data, like if you're starting at index zero, you're multiplying index zero or whatever, like forget uh, a large matrix, you have rows, right? So it's a row, column, row, column. Yeah. 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 So if you're working with row zero, column zero, yeah. uh, that's happening at the core level. Yeah. So if it's not available at the core, you have to fetch from somewhere. That's yeah. the communication part. But as a programmer and as a performance engineer, your role is to figure out how you can structure your program so that whenever you, let's if when, whatever row and column you're trying to multiply, it's available, it's already available at the core or as close to core as possible. And the instructions, right? So it's like, you know, row, row, uh, zero, column, zero. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it. that's part of the, that's the assembly language, but after yeah. compilation, what you get, right? Yeah. Your specific things. Uh, so what, the generated code the, uh, from whatever HPL or whatever you're running, that generated code, you typically don't you, you don't alter that. But in this low level C or Fortran, whatever is whatever language you're using to to run to write the matrix multiplication program, there you have to sort of align your you know these different access patterns or the problem size, align it with you know whatever is the capability, capacity of your system. And what helps you out here is what the UA said earlier, VTune, that's a profiler. That's, that gives you very low level information about all your system, all these things. What's the you know, capacity of these? What's uh, how, if you ran a certain program, you know, what instance, what level, what was being used? Uh, these caches as, uh, you know, as you were saying that it's there's sometimes flushes, you overwrite stuff things. So that's called like hit miss. If you're looking for something in L1, like core always looks for something at its registers. If it doesn't find it there, it looks in L1. If it doesn't find it there, it looks in L2. Then it goes higher and higher. Okay. So if it doesn't find something in L1 and goes to L2, that's called a miss at L1. If it finds something at L2, that's called a hit at L2. So this hit miss ratio, yeah. This process of finding it, uh, can we get around that by like? Knowing where it is, uh, the knowing is uh, something like hardware software code design. So, uh, L1, uh, so physical address is something that registered in a yeah. MMU. And if you want to know something that's in the remote, it's definitely registered in your uh, program. So, the software needs to know where specific. Uh, location in the remote no it is and to issue a network request and uh, get a request back with data i see so that's the lookup yes that okay. that that's the so every actually every layer has a different uh 
memory location technology like in this they have a main controller mm -hmm. and memory has a memory controller the network it has a NIC definitely NIC mm -hmm. so so every layer for Linux kernel it has already give you a lot of driver you can go for it and maybe for HPC scenario you has different framework to support those like UCX like uh, MPI Oh, and MCI yeah. has, has some support here, like CUDA aware, uh, NIC aware, RDMA aware uh, implementations. Okay, yeah, so the location is it's definitely, if it's not registered by uh, by the hardware, you need to, to yeah, yes, you I need see. to in your framework to report where the, your data is located, if it's in remote. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I want to uh, add something in the communication. So when you see something in the mutual, especially coming up with the MCI, all to all, something like that. All to all means uh, every node you have, you have to send every piece of the work to all of them. Yeah. So one, two, three, four, five, mm -hmm. and they will, every node has one, two, three, four, five. Send it. And normally that will pass a lot of waiting for your data. Mm -hmm. Because if your node is in your remote, it's definitely not determined in getting data back. Mm -hmm. That's that's why we need to balance our workflows. We're yeah, very well to know, know, know that topology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like one node isn't like, you know, doing a lot of work yes, and all these other yes. nodes are waiting on You know system. that uh, some of the, using the open share memory are kidding the RAM, right? Although they have some content switch and IPC overhead, but it's definitely a hierarchy better than network. Yeah, yeah, so, so nice. if you schedule something, you need to know that the ratio going to scatter on that node. Like maybe only two of them are and four in a local. So are these yeah. orders of magnitude faster? Yeah. yeah. Usually? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's so this is at the nanosecond level. This is like hundreds of nanoseconds or tens of nanoseconds. Yeah. This will go, you know, oh, probably a uh, millisecond range, microsecond range, sorry. And yeah, this. This will be probably millisecond range. From disk, it will be yeah. much higher, depending also on flash or hard disk. Network is very much higher. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's like an analogy. There's a good analogy in the web here if you want to try to search. It's like if this is like walking, like the speed at which a human walks, uh, or the time it takes to a person to walk, like 100 meters or something, the network could be like traveling from. San Francisco to uh, yeah, like, Australia or something. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that we can't, yeah. When I say nanoseconds, microseconds, we yeah, can't already, yeah. yeah. So there's that, they have tried to run like those orders of magnitude. Uh, yeah. That's Several true. orders of magnitude. Yeah. Which is why, like in HPC, you don't want to go through the stack, like one after the other. Uh, the terms that you was mentioning, like RDMA, uh, you know, that's, remote direct memory access. So this is memory. And if, so this, this uh, uh, at least this thing, let's say this, right? This is node specific. So this is on a single node. And if you have one more node like this, this node wants to talk to this. Without RDMA, what you have to do is, this node has to go to the network. Yeah. And then through network, you know, ask this, that is uh, yeah, super slow. Yeah. yeah, with RDMA, like it's through the network, but uh, okay, actually, it's, it's, okay. it's like through the network, as the CPU, the CPU will ask its RAM, okay, then RAM will send through network and yeah, send to its CPU. This is without RDMA. With RDMA, it can directly bypass the CPU and go to the RAM. And by CPU, I mean like the Linux kernel and everything so that's called kernel bypass that with rdma you can just bypass all these layers of the kernel and you can directly access some other nodes memory ram itself and that makes this mpi uh, running mpi applications fast but like yeah, this is a lot of uh, theory here the idea was just so that you understand these different terms because you will encounter these terms if you run any sort of application profiler and you understand that there's a, there's networks of, uh, sorry, magnitudes, orders of magnitude difference in accessing these different uh, memory, you know, 
subsequent uh, levels. Yeah, in your profiler, you will see because CPU you want to pull in data from RDMA, they will just have some driver functions. So you'll see that there's a long time waiting for that driver. And the process of RDMA is you first register memory in your remote. And the remote business kernel will register memory for you. And that memory is specific for your uh, data. It's like a pre allocation process. So like it's the simple. very beginning of your application. And sometimes your application, your calculation of your performance was start after that registration. Oh, so it's yeah. got to allocate the data and then, and then the start. Counting the performance. Yes. Oh, then start. Yeah. Counting. Sometimes you can move some of the that kind of data code before, yeah. and you will get definitely better if you can modify. It would be better for performance for the calculation of the performance. Why is it getting better performance? Because you are free allocating your memory, and if you figure out your layout, you can do some smart distribution of your memory. Oh, I see. Like based yeah. on the on the parameters. Yes, ba based based on your your observation of the. Oh, yeah. And RDMA after you register that memory, all the your networks are only interact with your register memory, and uh, they have different scenario uh, types. Like uh, the same with the TCP and UDP, but they call RC, U UP, uh, UC. RC. Uh, yeah, but you need, they have four, mm -hmm. but one one is not implemented. This so is for register? No, this is for RDMA's primitive, programming pair primitive. Okay. Yeah, they will register, um, they will do, do something in DAX because the UDP asks three times and RD, uh, TCP asks seven times of the RDP. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you all definitely care about this because they're UDP is faster. Yes, you, yeah. but unreliable. So if yeah, it's so something it's yes. I see what you're saying. Yes, you you want to need that uh, your memory that. types that you are transmitting between nodes are are in which scenario are that like you if you're statistically yeah. calculating that parameter mm -hmm. in, in physics or in other you, you can drop it. Yeah, I get yes, what you're saying. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you can rely on certain yes. things. Yes, that will be much faster. And yes, some yeah. of the your application that does not require your your precisions mm -hmm. that 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 you can use. Later. Sense. Yes, so some tricks, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're going to have to think about, right? Yes, yes, but, but in MCI, because the framework has already implemented all these, so those are just parameters. Uh, that you can kill. Yes, basically just parameters. I yes, but you, you need to know that. Then you know which parameter to know to tune to figure out to, that's better for your performance. And we get this by using the analysis tools. Right? Yes, yes. By by using the profiling tools. The profiling. Tools. Yes, yeah. yes. That makes sense. Yeah. So coming back to HPL and the parameters that you will tune, why all this theory was tuning these things essentially is to figure out like you know, how to spread your problem size so that you limit that you get uh, as close it is to RAM. You know that the uh, calculation will be done much faster. You get higher performance. HPL actually has a pre-compiled binary from Intel. So inside the core, that has already tuned for you. The only thing you need to tune is the network. So because the Intel does not pre uh, has that pre has that knowledge for networks, because yeah. they be do specific. not know how much link speed of your network is. Yeah. So that's the only thing we need to tune. Makes sense. Makes sense. And sometimes in the uh, super cluster, like we are doing something online, uh, their cluster, some of their cluster are heterogeneous. Like some of our oh, we are order lake. Some, yeah. Yeah. Some of our Neon serve. So so you also need to that know that cost model. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> but but you but when you're meeting with the specific uh, problem, you can just figure out because it, you got that knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some sometimes you just Write a program to automatically uh, to tune that oh. to the to the problem. yeah to the best parameter. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you just kind of run it and yes, let it go yes. for like a day or something, and it gives you just like hard parameters. Yes. Yeah. Yes, but you have to know that the, your in core has already built by the Intel, mm -hmm. and what's the hotspot you want to tune? Yeah. Are we yeah. gonna know that for the uh, ISCP? 
Uh, it's, yeah, you, you need to figure out yourself because the current uh, FAU and Bridges too, I never used before. Like for Singapore and for prior use uh, access uh, to Refluxer, I, I have some knowledge. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So even with like Intel's uh, uh, highly optimized binaries, that's like the, the compilation part is pre done for you. But you still have to define these things because this is machine specific. Whatever system, uh, whoever is doing so forth, this is for winter classic. So when, because HPL is only for winter classic, it's not related to ISC because we are virtual. So for the winter classic one, uh, since all of these are very machine specific things, so whatever system we get access to, we have to figure out the yeah, best things. So the problem size which can fit on RAM, but still need some space for the operating system, the block size, and how you are going to decompose such a large problem and distribute it amongst different cores. That's what P's and Q's defines. Like it's it's essentially a P cross Q combination of all MPI ranks. And what MPI for now assume there's one MPI rank per core. Okay, so Hummingbird, which has 24 cores, 24 cores, which is 24 MPI ranks or processes. For now, like these are very like MPI specific terms called MPI ranks, but it means is MPI processes. How many processes you're running at a time. For now, we are saying on one core, there's only one MPI process, okay? If you have 24 MPI processes, how do you distribute this problem size amongst them? And HPL gives you that tunable of P and Q. So you want to, typically this is a best practice thing that people have realized and shared with everyone else, is you want it to be closer to a square as possible or some sort of yeah, rectangle which is as much closer to a square as possible. Yeah. So that it's like a uniform distribution of work. Now, this is a good place to start. You never know, you may, you may find based on, again, based on how your processor is, how your socket is, it may be that a different uh, decomposition is, is, is better, but mostly that is, yeah. So like for 24, in, uh, in the practice run that we did last week, we, did, we set it as four cross six. Uh, and yeah, what you you could try is or a six cross four, three cross eight, eight cross three. But we have, have uh, you know two cross two cross six or something. No, it's a two D. It's only and Q. Yeah. Oh, I get, I get. Processes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, this is what these things are. These four tunables that you have. Now this is a bit of theory, but like yeah, okay. Now that there's some, uh, you know idea about how these things affect or uh, dependent on your machine. Let's go to some hands-on and let's try it out. So I'll share my screen again. Okay. So let's let's just search for pune hpl dot dat. Uh, let's start with the first link itself. How do I tune my HPL dot dat file? And like, yeah, they, they have created an online calculator to help you out. So let's try for Hummingbird. Yeah. Okay. So for starters, let's try with a single node. So one node, how many cores per node? 24 cores per node. How much memory per node? So let's verify. It was 128 GB, right? Let's see if it, uh, S info. Yeah, 128 GB. So what's 128 GB in terms of MPD? Let's try that. Yeah, okay. It's not accurate. Yeah. And let's say this is like, this is a decent block size to start with, 192. Let's keep it uh, as it is. Uh, 131, let's try that. I'll try, we want it. Uh, okay, let's go. So it generates an output file, and 
let's only pick the ones like uh, ns which is 117120 and let's modify our hpl dot dat to this so we go to ns we kept it as 20 last time let's keep it let's me change it to 117120 nbs let's change it from 4 to 192 tnq let's keep it as 4 and 4 plus 6 because like that's a decent place to start that okay so yeah with these things let's submit a job and let's see what happens okay it started running for me Uh, Mark, if you are facing some issues, right? Yeah, this is what is driving it. Yeah, I uh, yeah, everything was edited. Oh. Yeah, we're just sort of making a movie. But I did this on the computer. Okay, I got basically the same. Yeah, on a typing method, we did that dispatch. We it dispatch does. Right now, we are just building. Oh, this is just the building. Is it built? Yeah. I don't know what was going on last time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you changed it. Yeah, it's changed. Yeah. yeah. Could be like some. That's what happened many a times. Like if you when you do an interactive session yeah. on a uh, compute node, uh, and you're trying different build things. Some previous, you know, something that we set in the previous build, which we it is it still persists in the environment, and that interferes with a new build that you're trying. Yeah. So yeah, we yeah. want make clean. Try to resolve that. Yeah, even then, I did. Yeah, yeah even then, something persists. So it's always like we just log That's out. So and log weird. Out. I definitely did. I remember yeah. I made. Uh, I had a mistake when I first ran the make file, so it could have been that. Yeah. There you go. I'm glad it was easy to fix. <laughs> yeah, you didn't. How about you? Oh yeah, I did. I read it. You're running the new one. Uh, yeah, I read it. I did it last night. Oh, awesome. Out. Yeah. What what performance were you getting? I got like seven. Wow, seven thirty-two. Yeah, this, uh, yeah, US pops. Uh, Shift G is a good. Uh, it goes to end of file. Are you doing okay? It's like it's less. Oh, right there. Okay, it's like around seven hundred. Oh, okay. Uh. At the end, you should get like. Yeah, it doesn't have it. Like it changes. Oh, I tried pasting it. Uh, okay, I think it. Uh, it didn't complete because probably the time that you allocated. How much? How long did it run? It was over fifteen. Wow. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Because I, I'll show you how my output files and. Uh, uh, I was different. I wasn't sure why. Mm -hmm. Did you? I think it was the head mode. Oh, shit! Are you running it on the head? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. From if you do it, yeah, if you're doing it, you're doing patches. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Oh, there you go. And it runs in the unit. Yeah. I don't know if it's a post or it's not either. <laughs> Thank you. 
So right, this was a very um, the the default run from last week, right? So like yeah, it ran for some time, uh, and at the end it gives you this result, which is what you have to report. So this passed, and it says passed. Uh, this is what you can use. So since this was a very small problem size, you got you know such a low number. Let's see what happens this time. This time, yeah, see it's running very slow because it's only done like two percent of the actual computation. And how much time is spent? Uh, like at least five minutes. So it will probably take over an hour uh, to get the. And what may have oh, happened so with you? It does it in like real time. Like it updates this in real time. Yeah. Right yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna check the one I did last night. So yeah, this will take a lot of time. Uh, but like, yeah, that's the thing with HPL. Like, it, when you go to such a massive problem size, it just takes a lot of time because you're multiplying across large matrices. But we can also try to do one thing, which is how to monitor a run live. Like, how do you, act, how do you, like without, we are not using a profiler right now, but there are some other tools with which you can see whether a run is running properly or not. So for that, we do something called like we search into the compute node on which the runs you know happening right now. So, uh, could you um, put the the batch command we use to run? We just this batch and whatever is your submit script. So yeah, so you, the submit script is something that we have. Like we have put all our yeah, you know requests uh, or whatever constraints in the submit script. So that's a particular partition, one node, per task, there's one CPU, runs for an hour, exclusive access to that node, and yeah, the other things. You have to be in um, the, uh, the location where OpenGlass is? Or... No, no. This is, this is like you can create a directory of your own. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. So it's... So whenever a normal, it depends again from uh, cluster to cluster. Mm -hmm. But typically, what happens is when you s batch or you run s mm -hmm. run or anything, sure. yeah, uh, not not just that. When you s run, uh, do an interactive login or a batch login to a node. So it goes. It starts from your home directory. So right now, since my submit script and my input file is in a different place, what I'm doing is see change to the submit submit directory, right? The directory from where I submitted my job. Yeah. So it'll go there. It uh, This is my way of doing it just because I want to organize my different runs and you know, fashion. And that makes sense. The so it job creates, a, yeah, creates a, uh, a directory with the job ID and I copy the uh, input file to this new directory because I want to keep like modified input files separately, which are specific to a run. Then I go to this new, newly created directory, and there I run, and you know I, I run MPI run is the command that we use to run uh, an MPI job, and yeah, inside this newly created directory is the copied HPL dot that, and the uh, standard output that I'm capturing from MPI run, and what also happens is Slurm also creates well, Slurm also pipes the standard output via a file called slurm dash job id dot out in the directory from where you submitted the job and that's what's happening here so i sort of monitor both things and yeah like right now what this is 3.4 percent again pretty slow but like yeah it's going slowly i don't think it'll complete within the hour so i'll submit another job with a higher time limit and Let's hope for the best. I don't know how it's I don't know. It's on yeah. Is it on this? Yeah. Right. Okay. Switching to the MPI run to the jerky. Okay, 
started running, so that's fine. Uh, yeah, e even if the first one doesn't complete, we can see. I, I can post later how how much performance I have. But yeah, if uh, it's better to like yeah, rely on the final thing that you get. You should get that passed because that's the way it shows that okay, your job was completed. But, okay. So like uh, this is what you will do actually like during the competition. We, we may use, uh, if it's like an Intel cluster, uh, Intel, it's here, Intel optimized Linpack benchmark for Linux. You know, this is something that's uh, available on the web. Yeah, it's, if I remember correctly, it's prepackaged as a part of Intel MPI. So whatever mentor, system cluster we get access to and if Intel MPI is already present there uh, the optimized HPL binary from Intel is already a part there. Uh, let's see if it's available on uh, the Cori system. So I, I did it yesterday that it, it requires the Intel MPI. Right. So it's not compatible with uh, over MPI. Uh, yeah true we'll have to use Intel MPI. Because I'm doing it for my for my workshop paper. <laughs> oh. I think the files is about the mount. Oh yeah, this this system was uh, recently restarted. <laughs> yeah, I have as well. Don't put it on the system page. Mm -hmm. No. Any luck running? Uh, uh, excuse me. I think I need to recompile it on the. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, Victor, how about this? Which is the layer? Uh, I'm hey. here. Yeah. Hi. Uh, any doubts in what we discussed till now, or uh, do you want any no, any other clarification? Um, it, it's, yes, it seems okay. Um, I'm, I'm currently trying to just uh, I'm currently trying to 
I'm not sure how to like run like this HPI. Or... Uh, how to run it, right? So did you, uh, were you able to build it? Uh, uh, no, no I, got, I got like an error or something. Okay. Uh, you can try, we got it right now, Simon. Uh, I'll give you permission to share uh, so we can try to see what's, what's the blockage. Um, I, I'm actually like I'm actually running it on my laptop on the laptop like no, but I'm but I'm, but I'm using like Zoom on my computer. Oh. Okay. Um. Uh, so, yeah, if you're unable to share the screen, you could probably uh, just like tell us what's the where where you're where you're getting stuck. Um, wait, wait, um, can I try joining, joining Zoom on my laptop? Sure. Okay. In the meantime, since HPL, you know, takes time to run and like I predominantly just told you that right, these are the four things that we need to focus on, uh, for the input file. The other thing that one needs to focus on is the MPI run command because that's that's where. So right now we are focusing only on a single node. When you have multiple nodes, these things will change because you will define the problem size according to the total system memory. You will define P and Q according to the total number of MPI processes, and then apart from changing the HPL file according to the total number of memory and total number of MPI processes, what you need to tune is the network performance yeah and that is with mpi run so uh, right now on hummingbird it's such an old mpi which i'm so surprised at how how is the default mpi such an old one so open mpi 1.10 or something and the latest one is open mpi 5 which and every like major release there has been you know a lot of performance uh, features that they've added. So, not even sure. I don't think I, I don't think I've even used OpenMPI one ever. But what you can change. Uh, let, let's talk. Let's start slowly about how you can tune MPI run. Uh, Okay. So before MPI, there's one another fact that I want to draw your attention to. When we built HPL, we kept a compiler flag called f open MP, which is uh, us uh, GNU compiler optimization flag, and what it says is to enable something called OpenMP. And what OpenMP is, for now you can think of it as a threading library. Threads, okay? So threads are a way to run multi-processor jobs on a single node. So the, the, the way we're talking here, if you have a CPU, which has four cores, so core, core, or, or, and if you're trying to break a large problem size, such that each core is doing some part, trying to solve some part of this problem, you you, you can use something like OpenMP to help you do this you know, multi-threaded, distribute the problem size and help control the communication between the different cores on a single node. So OpenMP is yeah what. HPC community typically uses. If you take uh, CSE courses like 130, uh, which is like computer systems, and when you go to 
basic Linux kernel and something. They use something like it uses something called P threads, which is like the the OG you know threading environment that Linux provides. But uh, HPC folks wanted some you know a cleaner abstract uh, uh, language, I guess, or construct, I guess. So OpenMP is the thing there, and one. Uh, Okay, one basic example of how OpenMP helps is if you have something like a for loop. And normally when we write code, we write like for loop, which is like some starting point, some uh, limit and some incrementation, right? And we deal with like, if A is an array, we deal like element by element, we operate on single and like individual elements and do something on it. Like this is our way of writing code typically. Now again, so that means like you're doing that one element at a time. And if you have four cores at your disposal at your disposal, how do you improve the performance? Or how do you make it quicker? So you can do it like if this is like a, a hundred element array, you can say that each core works on 25 elements, so 0 to 24, 25, blah, 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 okay? And do this op uh, operation. Assuming this operation is like, doesn't have any dependencies on other elements. So if it's just like AI equals AI into 20, 112, or whatever, some embarrassingly parallel uh, operation. What it means is there's no dependency between other elements. Okay. So you can easily uh, divide it into these four chunks and you can have each core working on 25 elements rather than, uh, you know, 100. So theoretically speaking, you should get a 4x improvement because one core working on 100 elements versus four cores working on 100 elements, which is one working on 25, you should get a 4x performance improvement. Now here, like you, as a, a programmer, you would probably uh, start by doing it yourself, saying that okay, I have, I can, uh, you know, whatever, do uh, do this like AI, a something I plus I can change this to twenty five AI, uh, whatever plus twenty five I plus fifty, so on and so forth, and just give offsets like my seven. Write this in four lines, like divide this into four lines. That's a, my way of doing it, like as a programmer, my hard coding way of doing it. Now, if these things change, I have to rethink again and you know change things again. If the number of cores change, everything changes, then I have to recode hard to re-hard code it again. Another way to optimize it is if the compiler that is converting your for loop into machine code is actually runs on this on the CPU, if your compiler is smart enough to do this automatically, and modern compilers are, uh, when you do something like, if you remember, there's another uh, compiler optimization we use called O3. Okay. That's a very aggressive, this is O, I don't know, how do I say, orange, I mean, this is O, not last time, I think someone confused it with zero, so uh, let's keep it O, but whatever, O3. Yeah, and that's um, an aggressive optimization flag, which one of the things which it enables is this, which is called loop unrolling. So like, in a way you are, instead of running it for like 100 elements, we are dividing into four chunks, right? So you are, instead of doing something 100 times, you have unrolled it and said, let's do it 25 times only, but with in four different whatever verticals. And that's for now. It's you can just uh, you can just know that O3 something that enables it. Okay. Now there's another uh, there's other things like this. So this is a compiler dependent thing. Okay. Now with HPC, uh, OpenMP is something that can enable this as well. And how OpenMP does is like instead of modifying the body of the loop, you just ask OpenMP to optimize this particular for loop. And you do that with something called pragmas. Like this is the way how OpenMP codes are written. You can write like you if this is your for loop, just before it, like this is your for definition. This, this, this. 
just before it, you had Pragma OMP or blah, blah, blah. And you just said, okay, Prag open MP, or well, this is something I want you to focus on. Use your, you know, the way you are, like how open MP is designed, optimize this place. And Pragma is just like a uh, preprocessor going in. Preprocessor oh, will take over it. Okay. Replace it with a compiler um, literal. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So this is some modification as a at the source code level that you have to do to enable to uh, support OpenMP. Yeah. And most HPC applications are already with this fragma. So even if you disable OpenMP while building the application, if OpenMP is disabled, so that means you will prop this is enabling it for uh, if I remember correctly, like it should be something like F no open MP or something. Uh, this is like explicit disable. And if you don't put any flag, it's by default disabled. So if it's disabled, we'll just ignore the pragma part and focus on the for loop and do it how you how you originally wanted to do it. But most H HP oh. HPC applications already have this pragma. Um, at least the ones which we'll encounter for the winter classic. Hopefully they already have the open MP pragmas. And when we just give F open MP for GNU or dash Q open MP for Intel, uh, it will ask open MP to do this threading, to use this threading library and do a better job at the node level. So it's like a tag for that specific block of code, like that specific form. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it will be like pragma, uh, open MP does it for like, the code that designed the application developer would have done this for all for loops or whatever is the most load intensive for loop. Oh, yes. In your yes code. We're not really going to be doing this. Yeah, you're not going to be doing this. Okay. I mean, you could if your application yeah. doesn't support it. Yeah. Like we had it in ISC last year, I think one of the application. Yeah. yeah one of the applications, it didn't support OpenMP. Okay. If we had time or interest, we could have optim uh, written, modified it ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I want I want to add something. So OpenMP 5.0 currently supports GPU code generation. Yeah. So you take the GPU, uh, you can make the for loop one, and it's automatically uh, supported, and you can just test the uh, environment to switch it on whether to offer or not. So they have a version of uh, GPU as a uh, one core. And the second is the, uh, that Pragma actually support a lot of things that they do a static analysis of the variables. Like I is the iterator, and maybe A together is something else, and they can separate into different sections. And sections are being scheduled on different, uh, their abstract is as a different course or GPU. And they do analysis of different sections, whether they have a dependency or not. Now, uh, and if they had dependency, you need to use a DAG to analysis, like to how to schedule it one by one, and they also support them. We the multiple dependencies form. in the parallel. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah. so that's how they do the static uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. So for, uh, a more specific uh, tool, so so um, so only the memory access or uh, that kind of array or vector access or matrix access is very straightforward to optimize. But sometimes they have something like uh, they're instead of uh, doing sequentially, maybe they're accessing like uh, like a like a parallel. No, no, no. Like a, so. So maybe this is a this is a memory like your story is a matrix and you access this way. Oh, and they can also optimize this. Yeah. So this is something like i plus j plus some uh, yeah, yeah. time zone of the k and yeah. to iterate like first that first that first that right. That's a good and, and and this is another uh, OpenMP tunable. Program. So this is like how we would orient our data. Yeah, you don't need um, to do it yourself, or well, that means we can transform. The data compiler data. already support this. They can they can make it back, <laughs> like yeah. sequential. Yeah, yeah, move it. To yes, something that's yes, better for the yes. Like a square. Yes, OpenMP can support this. Yeah. So so you need to aware that how much your compiler can actually support yeah. that yeah, kind yeah. of optimization. For and, this, and, yeah. For this specific thing, is it a good idea to optimize it in in the memory transfer thing, or should we 
like look at the, you the need, data itself. You need to make all the memory to to uh, in accordance with your uh, machine, uh, your core semantic. So you, you need to make it like dry streaming. So 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 to make it you know, yeah, it's the it's better. No, no, I know what you're saying. Like, if you get data like this, you want it to be like this. Yeah. So it's just like, you know, X, X and Y. And, yeah, I think it's interesting. Yes, and, and also for the hyphen app OM and hyphen all three, different compiles support different kind of validations, especially for Intel. They know the x86 very well. Sometimes, you know, let's, let's take an example. For example, uh, like memory load using ABX 512. The GCC will not gen that uh, specific instruction. But uh, after Intel's compiler, like knowing that uh, sometimes the unaligned load does not hurt your cost model, like using a lot of other instructions to build the same thing. Like if you want to load 17 bits in, into your instruction, like ABX 12 or in memory. The online move AQX is maybe the fastest. Here, uh, Intel will, will, will support that. So sometimes we, we need to know the, the assembly of what they're getting. You know, the assembly. Yes, yeah. yes, you need to know that. Yeah. Or if you still need to know that all three, how they get it and what's the cost model of it. I see what you're saying. So yeah, just beyond like O3. Yes, like yes. and, and you need to, to see it. Even O3 is not a bad thing because compiler, something can know that. Something cannot. Uh, when when it can know it, something because you know, some of the past values by functions, you don't know that like it's within a bound of eight, it's no bigger than eight. So the compiler will not as yeah, and that uh, as aggressive as you want. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yes. So, so you need to you need to somehow know that your input, what it is, and like give some compiler hint sometimes in here. They will it'll get you like two times like because if you know that it's within a bit, sometimes you can you can just using a smaller register representation in your ABX five twelve, like sixteen bit to eight bit. No. No, makes sense. That's pretty. Like that's pretty sound. Excellent. Like lower the precision or lower the bits representing representing everything, you will get better performance, like two x. Yeah, yeah. That's all I want to add. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah and I want to add something for uh, OMT. So it, it supports something called section. So so for every section, um, you have some code difference, like something like A B, yeah. and this is right to B. And this is return B. So they have some read for after write or DAG. So they know that if you schedule, like you can be like, this is like, let's more chop and more chop. Um, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and we can have like this four and that four. Yeah. So, sometimes um, you need to schedule, like you can, you can do it this way. Like we need to make it all the throughput yeah. very good. So like a sequence. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, so that's the DAG analysis that's in your open compiler are supporting for your kind of scheduling. And if you add up to the uh, CUDA code gen, that's they need to add the cost model for that. Yeah. That the DAG has more weights, how much time they will consume, and how to schedule the workload. Yeah. That makes sense. Yes, yeah, like, yeah, yes, I have yes. no idea how it works for achieving but um, so there's many talks. Like normally I when I was tuning the SIMD, I first see how open NT works. Yeah. And to see how the compiler can first at first side give me a adequately good performance with SMD. And if you couldn't, I, I should see it see through it very well. But SIMT are very similar to SIMT. They also can support the same primitive, but they have other primitive because it has some primitive for strats, and they have some primitive for comment locks and uh, shuffles. For primitive, you just mean like uh, a set of parameters? Or uh, primitive means that the set of instructions that can illustrate or represent all the operations supported in one kind of uh, oh, machine. You mean like a architecture? 
It's something like a instruction yeah. or architecture for supporting specific Redefine uh, instructions. Yes, yes. That's a set of yeah. yes. Like when we're saying simply uh primitives, we 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 made that this stands for the Intel set of instructions that can support like multiple data in one single instruction. And for SIMT primitives, they have the other and they deprecated something because they found that uh, the, the, with times users don't use some of the primitive. So just mm -hmm. deprecate it. Okay. Yeah. And maybe their future GPU support doesn't support that. So they deprecate it. And I, I want to add something like how P, P threads works in that program. So uh, at this site, we all know that if your process is spawning your threads, uh, you, you already can get a copy of what you are, um, what, what your desired uh, function uh, variables here, like A, if you spawn the P address and share this struct, they will like copy the index here, there, mm -hmm. and you leave the A in place that all the like P address, like it's operates all the memories in place. In place, it's the same memory. Yes. So, like in the in the memory, like if you chunk them into four, like P threads is like they spawn it and they know like get a copy of I, and and they are actually doing ac accessing the same code snippets, but with different index. I get you're saying. Yes. So they are they're not a copy of A. It's just yeah. a copy of I. Yes. They so, want they want yes. to change I. But they yes. Don't. Yes, and I maybe if it wants to protect it, maybe they are atomic. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah, that's one. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so this was like just giving you some idea about what OpenMP does and how it's like node specific, intra node is what we would say. Um, what I wanted to next talk about was how we view uh, MPF, which is inter node or going beyond. What's happening yeah, inside the world. And what things we normally tune there. So again, I, I, I don't spend time uh, on the theory, but rather give you like the high level overview of the things that we can tune in MPI. Which is for the command called MPI run that we use to launch a multi-node job. Run multi okay so uh yeah all these things as you search like you know if you're using let's say open mpi uh as we are using here if you search just for and look for the documentation and search for like tunables for optimization you'll get so many parameters so things that we initially start with is like Suppose on, I want to run on four nodes of Hummingbird. Four nodes of HB. Okay. So if if there are 24 cores per node, so 20, uh, four nodes will be 96 cores, which is, let's assume I'm keeping one MPI rank, one MPI rank per core, which will be 96 MPI ranks. Now I can ask MPI run. How like I can define how these MPI ranks should be launched or mapped to cores, right? So you will typically say uh, if you notice the submit script that we have written right now, it already has a flag called dash MP, which is number of processes. Right now it is 24. For this, it will be 96. Then uh, in open MPI, there'll be something called map by PPR, I think. And which will be something like four per node. I have to verify, but <clears throat> but this says it, like this may vary. This again varies from uh, MPI to MPI. So with Intel MPI, this will be something like PPN or processes per node. And we can say that okay, since there are four nodes, twenty-four cores, twenty-four processes per node, this will be both. Like this is twenty-four and PPN twenty-four. So okay, this is the initial, the basic thing that you want that 
you are describing the workload that you have and the number of cores that you want to work that workload on. 96 cores, 24 MPI ranks, uh, sorry, 96 MPI ranks, 24 MPI ranks per node, okay? Then uh, there are other ways to change how these things, right? So if, if let's say one node, as you said, as whatever, 24 cores, Another node is similar. This, this. How do we map the MPI ranks? Okay. So do we like if if you have ninety six MPI, which let's say is numbered from zero to ninety five. Okay. How do we actually map on these four nodes? Is it like zero, one, two, and go on till whatever twenty three here, then twenty four, twenty five, uh, blah blah blah. 47 here, 48, okay? So this is one way to go. Fill all ranks, fill. So these are nodes, okay? So four nodes, fill like one after the other. Another way to, this is the default thing, okay? Another way to do is something called round robin, which is if you have four nodes or four buckets, you can go like zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so on and so forth until all 95, zero to 95, all are there. So this is another mapping pattern that we can use. Now, this is about the mapping. Now, next comes is something, the interconnect that we talked about earlier. And MPI run can, and what UA was also talking about earlier, UD, UDP, uh, RC, and all those tunables, which are interconnect specific. So this is an important term because uh, interconnect is something which, so for the winter classic one, when they'll give us access to you know, whatever system, they'll probably have a getting started or some documentation about describing the system, how that system is designed, how that cluster is designed. And in that document or in whatever presentation that do that they do, they talk about the interconnect. Now, interconnect is majorly of two types or two, yeah, two. Nowadays it's one type, but okay. Uh, it used to be two types. Uh, the most popular one, which everybody uses, typically most people use is something called infinite band or uh, which is by a company called Melanox which is now a part of NVIDIA. But yeah, so this is a proprietary, very high speed interconnect or network, which is InfiniBand, which is designed by this company called Milnox, and which a couple of years back was acquired by NVIDIA. But yeah, this is something that, so they have uh, different libraries that you can use. So as you was also saying, there's something called UCX uh, with MPI, uh, something like lib fabric, uh, with Melanox, there'll be something like, uh, uh, NM, H call, uh, blah, blah, blah. Right now, the only idea is the, the only thing I want to convey right now is these terms, because you have to search for these terms in the documentation. I mean, I'll be there with you, but like, yeah, these are the terms you have to sort of keep in mind because these are different parameters that you can choose and try out and see if that helps improve performance. Like what you see it. So yeah, this is something, uh, what else was there when you see it? But uh, like, this is all a part of something called, which NVIDIA distributes called HPCX, which is like uh, a big package, which contains very optimized MPI, very optimized compilers. And you can use HPCX to build, uh, just launch HPCX and load HPCX and use it to build. So it already, ha it has a very optimized set of uh, MPI or uh, primitives and the MPI library so for, which is optimized for like inside the node, uh, inter node. Uh, MPI, another way to look at, uh, or another way to classify MPI is, it's normally of two types, like, the operations that these ranks do are of two types. One is called point to point, and another one is called collective. 
So point to point, as the name suggests, is like one MPI rank is talking with another MPI or sending some data or receiving some data from another MPI rank. So it's always you know a one to one thing. Collective is a broad. Um, it can be of any grouping. So it's more of a like as the name suggests, collective. So either I am sending information to multiple ranks, or I am pulling information from multiple ranks, or it can be multiple ranks, whatever subset of things. So yeah. So each of these have different algorithms inherently implemented in MPI, and there are different tunables to you know tune all these algorithms. So like yeah. You, have, you can tune these things. You can tune what type of interconnect libraries or backends that you're using. You can tune how MPI ranks are placed on different nodes and between different ranks. So for now, like, yeah, this is what you typically, you also start with, like, you can also, another thing to note here is when uh, I'm not sure how it will be for these competitions, because I don't think they'll ask you to run it on like a large number of nodes. It'll probably like one, two, four, maybe eight nodes, something like that. Like that is what was with HPC, uh, sorry, with ISC. Even now it is like one to four nodes, if possible, eight nodes. So, and most applications that they'll be using and the data sets that they're using easily scale up to eight and more than eight nodes. So what I'm trying to convey here is this thing always will more or less hold true for most applications that we run, that one MPI per core. Uh, but this can change uh, if the data set that you're using does not scale to that high of, uh, of an MPI count, okay? In which case, you have something called MPI plus OpenMP, a hybrid sort of distribution where uh, you may say, Let's not keep one MPI per core. Uh, if this is just an example, okay? Just just uh, telling you like about a variety. Just again, terms that I'm not asking you to understand everything right now. Just you know, have these terms at the back of your mind so that when you're actually running and trying out different things and looking, because that's what we're going to do for this uh, for this competition. They give us an application. They give us okay. This is the cluster. We are just going to search on the internet. What's the best practices for a particular application for a particular data set? what things we can try out and then we try it out on those systems. Okay. Now there, if we have time, we can always use profilers and generate some more logical things to try out. But if, since we don't have a lot of time, we have to rely on other people's recipes, the domain experts recipes to get better performance. And again, something that they use is something called hybrid runs where if your application or your data set does not scale up to you know, these many ranks, uh, if it cannot scale up to 96 MPI ranks, maybe you could try something like half the number of MPI ranks, so 48 MPI ranks, and each rank launches two open MP threads. Okay, so you have you still have 96 workers here. You have 96 workers here, but now here what it's saying is one MPI rank. It will now sort of handle two cores instead of having. So it's a very rough way of saying one MPI per core versus one MPI per two cores. And this is something that because MPI district is like, you know, talking about distributing the breaking the actual problem size into grids and having, you know, whatever a certain subset of it allocated to a core, right? If the data set does not scale well, you can reduce the number of MPI ranks and try out something like OpenMP to work in conjunction with it, which is like about the threading aspect, like which is, so the way, again, a very high level thing, how MPI tries to parallelize things and how OpenMP tries to parallelize things are two different concepts. Their ideologies are different. Uh, so something like this could help get better performance than 96 MPI ranks. And this is just, again, something to be aware of if have time, and if you see that it's not scaling, so how we will actually study this, whether it's scaling well or not, is we will run it like this. We will run it on a single node. We'll run it on two nodes. We'll run it on four nodes. And if we are seeing that if this takes 100 seconds, and if this takes 50 seconds, and if this takes 25 seconds, then this is perfect scaling. And if we get numbers close to this, 
let's say this is 100, let's say this is 60, let's say this is 40, this is still sublinear state, but still good enough, you know, good enough. So we, we can say that, okay, obviously as close it is, if it's closer to this, that's always better. We have to try to achieve this, to get as close to this side. That's where we, we you know, so we'll, we'll do this, uh, this sort of baseline runs, build something on one node, run something on one node, run something on two nodes, so if, again, I'm just talking about what scalability is. If scalability is going to be a part of the competition, then yeah, this is what we're going to do. So it's the best we can hope for is linear scale. Yeah, uh, I mean, super linear scaling is possible, but that's uh, I, I I don't think that's a, a true representation of the work. I can talk about one case where I know where super linear scaling happens and why it happens. It depends on this thing, but it's theoretically like like it it doesn't. If it even if it holds true for that particular data set, it it, it is not uh, you know something that will transferable. Yeah, yeah, it's not transferable to other data sets. That's very really something that uh, is yeah. If you have studied like machine learning, it's like overfitting to that particular data set. So you're seeing some sort of super linear ability. But like yeah, best case is linear, and you we normally get sublinear, and we have to approach this as much as possible. But uh, yeah, sorry, a lot of theory today, but it was just about throwing these terms so that they stick somewhere in the back of your mind so that when we are reading these documents in the competition, we can try out and actually, yeah, see which ones we can try. So I'll try to collate some. So uh, one thing where, you know, this thing, uh, we can, even on Hummingbird, if you, I'll share my screen again so that you can see that the issues that we are facing, uh, but. Like if you see here, right, this is the output of my uh, job that I ran on a single node. You see these initial errors that we are seeing. It cannot find lib RDMA. Uh, uh, there's, it cannot find lib PSM, infinity path. So yeah, it's by default, MPI run is trying to, you know, access these libraries, which can give you a high performance and it's not able to find. So MPI is designed in such a way that it starts with, you know, a certain high performance set of libraries. If it doesn't find it, it rolls back to, you know, more less optimized, but generally available libraries. So that's how MPI is. So it will try these things. And if InfiniBand is not available, it will run, run on Ethernet. So it's not that MPI is written just for HPC clusters. You can use MPI on any distributed system if you want. It can use any network that you have. But more or less, it is designed because of these special libraries. It is it can it works well with HPC sort of clusters, which has infinite and stuff. Uh, but yeah, like these are the errors that we have to fix on Hummingbird. And with that, when uh, if we find that, we can po I'll post that. I mean, whatever. Hope if we figure it out, we'll post that in, on Discord. And th this will more or less be figured out by some MPI run tunable. Do not use this or use that. But okay, let's see the run that, that we launched, right? So it's only like 25% till now. And this is the misleading part which happens, right? So uh, Aiden, like it's in the, in the beginning, it gave me like 746 gigaflops, right? And that was incorrect because like, as you see, as it progressed, it has dropped down and sort of, uh, it's plateauing at like two giga, uh, sorry, 200 gigaflops and that may be the thing with the current set of tunables that we are able to achieve. And it could, it could also, so the reason right now that I speculate for 200 gigaflops, whereas our base system, the theoretical performance is somewhat 844 gigaflops for a single node. It could be that we haven't chosen a large enough problem size, or it could be that the block size of 192 is not good enough for this system, or it could be that four cross six is not the most optimal decomposition, or it could be the MPI run is unable to find those things at the beginning. So it is uh, falling back to some, you know, less optimized library for communication, which is giving us such poor performance. So as you see, 
there are a lot of things to try out and we have to prioritize or run multiple uh, experiments parallelly to see which of these things is actually influencing our poor performance and yeah, that's what we're going to do during the uh, competition i know it's a lot to do but that's what this thing is makes sense yeah can you explain what the problem size is over time and how it's different than the block size Okay, so problem size is like the actual matrix sizes, like let's say for HPL, the actual thing that you're trying to multiply. So that something like 60,000 elements, if you're trying to multiply that, which fits in your RAM on a single node. Block size is how MPI ranks access these 60,000 elements. Since they can't, doing it one at a time is very slow and oh. you can't access all 60,000 at once. So it'll be like, you know, four by eight. Uh, no, not just like four by eight could be, uh, yeah, it's four by eight, but in a different way, like call it 32. Yeah. Like, let's say 32 elements at a time. And yeah, so one, yeah, at one thing, it's something like this. And whatever, right now that's 192. And each of these, like there are different levels of grouping that are happening. There's grouping at the level of MPI ranks with this P cross Q thing, where we are saying that 20, we divided the grid into uh, whatever, four cross, uh, whatever is the division. We superlay another, uh, I mean, overlay another, uh, what do you call it, mask on it, which is a four cross six, such that if this is the actual, if this is the actual grid of uh, problem decomposition, of the domain decomposition, we have another grid on it, which is like, four cross six and each MPI rank looks on, you know, on those things. That's a different mask here. That's a different, yeah. And block size is some more thing which is happening that how many blocks you are accessing. I think there are different ways to um, uh, I think yeah, it's over, over short, but like, yeah, uh, uh, I'll spend some more time and I keep some document, all these terms, try to just write down all the terms at least so that uh, we can, uh, you know, we have it ready in front of you when you want to try the experiments. Uh, I was hoping there were other people in the call so that we could discuss finally just uh, workload and schedules for the competition. Uh, one thing is, Okay, I'll stop sharing my screen so that I can see who are there. Okay, Kyle's here, Victor is here. Victor, are you interested in the competition? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess so. Okay, cool. So I'll, I'll suggest your name as well because we are like five people right now and yeah, uh, we, we have space for one more. So cool, welcome to the team. Uh, I need some things, uh, some uh, details from you and I'll post it on uh, Discord. You're on Discord, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll ping you there and I'll ask those details from you. Uh, but apart from that, uh, maybe you have some more idea about Alex's workload, but right now, like how's, how's uh, our things for whatever time this competition is for? How's your workload during the next two months? Oh, um... I, uh, I have no idea. Um, uh, not uh, that hard. Oh, you and Victor have the same classes? Very much. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Am I being asked a question? Uh, it was a general question for everyone. Oh. So I'm just sharing, like, uh, sharing something uh, in the classic. I, they haven't yet put in, like, the final details, but uh, they have at least updated. So, like, yeah, the completion starts in two weeks. Uh, which is next to next to next Monday. Uh, and yeah, uh, just checking if they've updated the rules. Yeah, so they haven't told which application, they've just told there's HPL, there's another application called HPCG. So before they release the applications, hopefully, these two micro benchmarks uh, we should be sort of familiar with how to tune at least the terms. Uh, but yeah, the 
the way this uh, I don't know. We'll talk about when it starts. Yeah, it's a tentative thing again. I'll ask Dan tomorrow to uh, you know, give some more like better idea how it starts. But let's say if it starts next to next to next Monday, which is the thirteenth. Okay. Uh, so if it starts on thirteen Feb, okay. Uh, so it will probably be whatever thirteen to eighteen. Uh, I don't know if they'll consider if they'll have weekends, but let's say thirteen to seventeen Feb. Then the next week will probably be a, a an off week. Uh, and so twenty to four. Seven, one, two, three. So the way things will probably be is like yeah, this will be work, this will be off, and then this will be work, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, yeah, at least for now, like let's like we we don't know how the structure is, but at least we know it starts on thirteen. So sorry. That week is at least, uh, you know, that's that week is when work is going to happen. So uh, it's up to you guys how you want to divide the work. What the earlier team had done was there were five people. They distributed like the applications amongst like each person handling one application. So if there are four HPC applications, four people for that. And one person who's handling like both HPL and HPCC because they are like smaller, they're micro benchmarks, they're not full-fledged applications. So, like that, uh, they are distributed. If we have, since we are six people, we can actually do it HPL, HPCC, and the four applications. Uh, but yeah, uh, and since it's divided like this, you everybody does not have to be have to be active like in all weeks. You know, they have to be super active in one week when their application is due. And the other weeks, if they are available, they can help out the person who's in charge. So that is one way to do it. The other is we form maybe smaller groups and have like two people work on two applications, but together rather than everybody doing it individually, you know, have it doing together. Uh, the other way is like all people, whoever is active, uh, or has free time during those that week comes and helps out, uh, which uh, in my opinion is like a lot of coordination because yeah, if, if there are whatever, three, four people and having to coordinate between three and four people during uh, the crux time uh, can be difficult, but not all, impossible. It's up to you guys uh, how comfortable, uh, you know, you are which which workload distribution suits you. So uh, yeah, I'll try to do one thing is ask Dan tomorrow which exact weeks is the work going to be there, is the competition going to be there. And again, in this week, how it's structured is I think the first day, uh, whoever is your mentor, like mentor for that application, they will have a web session with all teams. They'll describe the application. They'll probably give some hints as to how to build the application, how their cluster is on which we are going to run the application. You know, give all this sort of background information. In uh, so if that's on a Monday, uh, probably on by like Tuesday, you have figured. Sorry, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, is it person from the competition or is it from the school? Dan. The uh, Dan is like the. He's not from school. Oh, okay. He's the uh, organizing committee. Oh, okay. He's from some a company called Intersect 360 Research, and oh. they are the folks who started this competition. And he's been the one from the start. So yeah, he's uh, he's a point of contact for all logistics support and competition. So what does what does Scott do? Scott is our faculty advisor. Oh, okay. yeah. He okay. he is like uh, to help out to motivate. To, yeah. If there's any funding needed or anything needed, uh, funding like in the sense like of getting us access to such as yeah, yeah, sure. 
yeah but other things as well if uh, yeah, if there's any time, since we are a student driven thing if any time there needs to be a faculty who needs to sign up guarantee for us then yeah he's there for that and yeah he's also there if you have some ideas to brainstorm he, since he's very he's been very active in this field so during his phd uh, that's just a tidbit but uh, during his phd he devised the graph algorithm for breath burst search uh, which like in which he beat like some super computer system with his ipad or a certain benchmark called graph 500 yeah I think this was 2012 or something. I don't know if it was 2013 or even final year, uh, final work, the thesis for his PhD. And yeah, so he has good knowledge about HPC systems and you know how things work. Uh, so yeah, he's always there to help out and brainstorm. But yeah, uh, he's more like off hand, like he's more there. For, he's not going to handle the day-to-day things. For that, we have to manage it ourselves. It's mostly student-based. Yeah, yeah. such so student. So yeah, uh, that's about the structure. Uh, what What do you guys think? What What suits you? Uh, one person per application, two people or three people, or probably two people per two applications. Probably like one person as like a four, and then you know, you know, two people could like help on it. Mm-hmm. With like similar knowledge, and they could focus on like two applications. Okay. Yeah, something. But probably everybody like focusing on on a singular application is a good idea. Okay. Okay. Uh, what do you all think, Kyle, Victor? I think uh, either organization would be okay with me. Okay. Okay. Cool. Victor, how about you? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. Okay. Cool. Fine. Uh. Any idea what uh, Alex would prefer? I don't. I don't. I feel like I don't know like how much the workload would be right now. Like I feel like we should figure something out. We should have some system, and then once we actually get our like our feet wet, then we should figure out a better system. Because right now we don't really know what we're working with. Yeah. yeah. But like if you consider HPL, like since that's one of the applications, mm-hmm. and you have some hands-on experience with like building it and running it. uh and today we sort of give you a very high level overview of things that you will have to optimize uh it'll only be more than this like if it's a full fledged application it will be more than this but yeah uh what do you think like uh, i estimate something like this will be like a solid one week work like whatever we hpl is due it's going to be like you'll probably have to sacrifice some time Maybe some uh, extracurricular stuff or something, or something. Yeah. but that's if you are the only person working on it. Otherwise, if there are, you know people helping you out for experiments, if there are two or three people doing it, then maybe two hours per day, and everybody is doing it in their own time, trying out different things, coordinating and sharing what things they realized failed, what things helped, uh, because it's very incremental research, right? Like. to keep on building on top of each optimization on top of the other so yeah it more or less depends on how people are uh like how how is their availability during that week and that will define the workload yeah uh but okay just one thing uh if you all have like the dates of your exams i do i can get you those yeah, yeah. if you all can post that if you have any exams or project submissions or anything like if there's specific presentations uh, and specific days or you know specific couple of days where you'll be very busy uh, very busy just share it with us and you know, this like kind of overlaps with like final i think so because if it's starting in feb uh so if it's third march for feb 6 7 8 9 yeah so 10 is off Third, well, thirteen to seventeen is work. So yeah, again, twenty to twenty to twenty-four is far. So when you say it's off, um, what do you what do you mean exactly? It's just so like no work, like no competition. Work. And that's just um, what you're expecting, or or like that's what they have told. Work. It's one week on, one week off. Oh, so we have to take one week off. I mean, or, yeah. Are you just proposing?
Oh, no, no, no. Uh, there's no nothing due in that week. Yeah. I'm not even sure if uh, the. They get ahead. Yeah, if the, I'm not even sure if the cluster. Like, we could probably try experiments on our systems. They probably would have already released the applications that are due. But we may not have access to the actual system to run on. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you. I'll ask Dan for this as well. Uh, off weeks, uh, do we have access to systems? And also, like, exact schedule. Yeah, so uh, when's, the, when's the exam? I think it's this week. 15 to 17. In the quarter final exams, March 20 to 24. So, yeah, if instruction ends on quarter 17. Yeah. So, if they follow this schedule, it's exams week is going to be off week. That's a good chance. Man. Yeah, if yes, they so follow this schedule, uh, which is, yeah. But even just like having like, you know, a little bit of a buffer would be such a big help. Mm -hmm. Especially with clients. Yeah, so right now we have got, this, this is four weeks which have happened. When are they seeing Feb to March, late March competition ends. So I'm not even sure if it's going to be like, will probably be if this is the way this is and if like this is when let's say uh final uh gala is happening on uh, the, the end of march and if we have only like three weeks it will probably be two applications per week this is the schedule for uh, isc and the no, this is just winter classes in general. we're not talking about isc at all right now I'm not even focusing on ISC right now. Uh, yeah. So uh, from the looks of it, it's going to be three work weeks. Again, I'll verify this with uh, Dan. But like, yeah, it's going to be three work weeks and two apps per week. And those weeks are like, yeah, 13 to 17, 27 to 3rd, and 13 to 17 again. So yeah, we're making like six app, apps, right? Yeah. Really? Just for this, the winter? Yeah. And they're all separate, right? Yeah. So there's, there's HPL, uh, HPCG, and four apps. Or do we choose these? Or? No, no. They, they'll give us. They'll define the pro the application. They'll define the data set. They'll okay. define the problem statement, like whether it's a scalability study or time to uh, lowest time. Uh, yeah. Last time, I think it was. Uh, an application called Chromax, which is a molecular dynamics application. I think there was also NAMD or LAMPS. Again, both are again molecular dynamics. I think there was OpenFoam, which is a computational fluid dynamics application. And there was one more. This is 2021. Should be. And you were saying one of these apps would take a single person a week, you would estimate? Easily. Yeah. So again, it, it depends on how smartly we approach it, right? So the idea is not to, like, it, I, I started with building HTML from scratch without relying on anything, like just downloading source code, uh, an unoptimized open source source code and building it. Figuring out, okay, this is wrong. This is our hard code. And figure it out. That's what we were doing last week. Yeah, last to last week and last week. Yeah. But yeah, that is not the smart way to do if we are time consuming. But I wanted to do that because I want everyone to know that this is like, yeah, this is the base thing. If everything else fails, this is there for you. This approach will never fail because it's like the most basic thing. You're not relying on any pre built recipes or binaries or anything. So, uh, yeah, uh, the smart way to do it is to search for an app. Let's say it's Gromax, right? Gromax is a molecular dynamics application. Nobody should know, need, need, nobody needs to know what Gromax is or what Gromax does. But let's say it's an Intel cluster. Let's say Gromax, Intel, uh, just search Gromax Intel. See the first thing, which it's an Intel website, which is recipe building and running Gromax on Intel processors. 
this is a good place to start. They say this is where you download Gromax from. Now, it could be a different version of Gromax. Uh, doesn't matter. Like Performance may differ because the algorithm may have changed from 2016 to 2023. But the core logic is the same. So at least this is a good place to start for day one where you're supposed to get like the baseline results. So they say how to build it. Load compilers, load MPI, load the linear algebra library, uh, define the compiler flags, okay, so on and so forth, and just make and done. And you know, they have given a run uh, run submit script as well, so you can start running. And yeah, so they have defined it like okay, this is for Xeon five. It doesn't matter to us. Like uh, this is what we should be focusing on. We'll probably have a Xeon Gold processor or later. Xeon Gold was Skylake 6148. Like this is a family of Intel processors. Skylake was what? 2016, 2017 time frame. Uh, yeah. And 27, actually 2017, 2018 time frame. But yeah, now it's like Cascade Lake or whatever. Sapphire Rapids. Much so, but the idea is that, that yeah, you already have stuff like this available. Uh, and they'll most probably use some open source data sets. So like Gromax, these are two heavily used data sets, Water and Gromax Test Stage B. Uh, I just know about Gromax because I used to work with it a lot for in my earlier job. But like, yeah, you have some performance numbers for a particular processor and it gives you some idea how things scale. So like, let's see, what's this? Uh, normalized performance, okay, this is across different processors. So not really helpful because we won't be benchmarking different processes mostly. But like, yeah, this is a pre-made recipe. This is where we start. And another good thing to try out is obviously like uh, in, uh, like the, the application itself would have a lot of documentation. That's another thing to try out. See, Romance on Amazon, uh, if they are given a CAWS service, you know, they have defined, they have given documentation of how to run as well. Like there'll be something on how to run. Uh, another thing is there's something called uh, HPC AI advisory and they are a very uh, like they release these optimized recipes if I search HPC AI advisory uh, is it? Uh, let me search Romax best practices is one but anyways see i'm there to help you out with all this uh, i'm not sure to what extent i can participate but more or less i'll be sitting with all of you uh, i have defined my time so that i'm free in those uh, time periods and the thing is so i'll be there with all of you helping you out i'll prop the the way i see i can't participate is so each application has an application brief you like at the end of that week you have to describe that this is the baseline we got this is what we tried this is the best performance that we got and you have to define you know, write up something on it and probably defend it as well like in an interview so if i if we follow the structure that dan did two years back they had two interviews like the team had actually three interviews one at the start one in the middle and one at the end when they won so yeah and he was just chatting very informally asking what are you guys trying this thing? So I, I don't think I can be present there, but you, I can help you, you know, navigate through all these terms, but as participants, you have to be the ones who have to understand what things we tried and be able to articulate it to someone. You mean, you need not know the finer details, you know, like the, the, the knowledge UA has, it's good if you can get to that level, but it's fine if you don't know the nitty gritties, but if you know the terms that, okay, I tried OpenMP. Uh, why did I try OpenMP? Oh, I wanted to try something, some optimization inside this particular node and try different threading strategy, blah, blah, blah. I tried MPI. Oh, I tried these libraries. If you ask what's Kane, like if, if you need not know what KNM is, but you can, but you should be able to say that, okay, I tried KNM. I tried HCall, blah, blah, blah. I tried UCX. Yeah. That's your, that's, I think that's the expectation from these folks, because even they know that this is like a starter competition, like for people yeah. who haven't really yeah. worked with these applications. 
so yeah uh, i'm there to help you out but like yeah this is i think that's the extent to which i can participate in this competition uh but yeah like this is how you typically do like you search for like the application name best practices or the application name and like intel amd nvidia each hardware vendor will have run these applications and given some sort of recipe to build on their systems and that's what we are going to start at so yeah i sorry for overshooting today folks but yeah i think we have more or less covered like things which i wanted to say i'll just post it these things on discord and if you can fill in things that will be great uh, another thing i wanted to ask was about the photo uh, i tried a very lame sense that trying to <laughs> stitch to things but like yeah it, i it's honestly not that yeah, yeah. like you, you, you don't look you, close in it yeah look pretty real yeah uh, <laughs> yeah the sun thing <laughs> is something yeah. which, i think we took it at different times yeah, yeah. that's it uh, but yeah, yeah. do relighting yeah yeah really that, that there was but i i didn't want to spend an hour just on figuring out how to yeah, essentially i have a good guy to do it. yeah guys yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> relighting yeah. awesome uh, uh do you have a separate uh yeah, yeah. photo for yeah, it this is one photo and oh okay. yeah i'll, I'll send you yeah. <laughs> okay um uh, from that what what else do i need Oh, no, that's fine. Yeah, I send the things to Dan to Dan uh, today or tomorrow morning based on when the group photo is done. Uh, yeah, thank you. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Any doubts from you guys, Kyle, Victor, uh, Aiden? Do Do we need more like time? Should like we? Do we need more time to prepare? Should we give like another ten days and like meet up for a week? I mean, we'll be fine with that. If if you all if you all have the time, yeah, we can wait time for like another hour or two. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, sure. just like even if it's individual thing and you need like half an hour of some doubt solving or something, mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm here. You may you may not have the almost that much time, but we both usually are in E two, so you just ping us on Discord. Uh, we we'll we we can sync up. Yeah, I have you on Discord. Can I get uh? Uh, I'm Victor Young, zero zero. Oh, oh, you're on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay, Kyle. Uh, Victor, thanks. Uh, see you all soon. Uh. Bye. Bye, Victor. Bye.